This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. What would you do if your job was to figure out, on a global scale, who doesn't have enough to eat? Or, more importantly, who had insecurity in their life specifically because of food scarcity? Just thinking about the scale of the problem blows my mind a little bit. But then, now wait for it, what if you then had to also design and execute interventions that would, to a large degree, address those food security issues? Oh, and did I mention that this is a constantly evolving and changing process? Well, this is exactly what my guest for the 130th episode of the Terms of Reference podcast does, along with the team at the World Food Program's Vulnerability and Analysis Mapping Initiative. Jean-Martin Bauer is a senior analyst at WFP, where he leads the Mobile VAM initiative, which involves deploying digital innovations to collect food security data in near real time. He has been on the front lines of understanding food scarcity for years, and in this episode, he tells us about how VAM has evolved since its paper survey beginnings and where it will go in the future. I spoke with Jean-Martin in Rome. And hey, before we dive into the episode, if you like what you're hearing, take a moment to open up iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or whatever your podcast app happens to be and click on subscribe. Also, consider giving the show a rating because it really does help. And finally, please consider sharing this episode or the podcast on Facebook or Twitter to help others get in on making aid and development better. Now on to the show with Jean-Martin. Hello, Jean-Martin. Thank you so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. I see. Thanks for having me. Um, I know that you like to go by JM, so I'm going to call you JM on this call while we, while we go through it. Where, where do we find you sitting today? I'm in Rome, Italy. Uh, it's a gray and um, rainy fall morning. It's the middle of November when we're recording this in 2016, so I guess that's reasonable for, for Italy. I just, whenever I think of Italy, I think sunny. I don't know why. I think, you know, sunny hills and oh, yeah. gorgeousness. That usually is, um, but uh, not today. And uh, yeah, November's the, the, the time of year where the, the tourists uh, don't come and where it is uh, gray and rainy, uh, but the rest of the year is uh, fantastic. <laughs> well, I hope that you get to have a lot of that fantasticness in your life going forward. Uh, you work for the World Food Program. You work on a, a particular initiative called the Vulnerability Analysis and Mapping Initiative. Why don't we just start by you telling us about, just give us the overview. What, what, what does that initiative do? Great. So I, I work for the Vulnerability Analysis and Mapping um, service at the, the World Food Program. Uh, what we are is a network of about 150 analysts uh, worldwide. Our job is to track food security and to understand uh, essentially how many people are food insecure, what type of assistance they need, what's needed to help them rebuild their livelihoods, or the eyes and ears of the organization, uh, if you will. We are the, the analysts who uh, try to measure hunger worldwide and, and keep tabs on it. You try to measure hunger worldwide. I mean, give us a sense of the the enormity of the problem I and mean, just the fact that there's 150 sure. of you that already sort of speaks to it. But give us some detail on that. All right. So according to the WFP and FAO's most recent report, almost 800 million people go to bed hungry every night. That's almost uh, one out of 10 human beings. It's, uh, it's a big problem. And uh, our mission is to reduce hunger and to get to zero hunger by 2030. So we've got a, uh, the bars have really set high. There's a lot of ambition. Uh, we think the solutions are, are out there. We need to find the resources and the, uh, the ways to get us to, to zero hunger. And those include um, uh, targeted interventions to, uh, for nutrition, uh, responding to emergencies well, helping people uh, promote resilience, and, and a lot of other things. But the, the interventions exist. Uh, uh, to get us from 800 million today to, to zero in 2030, that's that's or um, uh, the game plan for us. So, as you look at that sort of gigantic number of people, what is it that the mapping initiative contributes to your ability to understand where they are, what they need, how the WFP can serve them, or how the humanitarian community community can serve them? Like, take us through like what is it that that the mapping initiative, like sort of the nuts and bolts of it, and how that contributes to your analysis. All right. So we, we have teams in every country with uh, where WFP has an operation, and that's that's more than 50 countries worldwide. These are the most food insecure, uh, most hunger prone countries out there. And we work with uh, governments and partners better ascertain the problem. Um, hunger is actually very much a moving target. The numbers change every year uh, and they change from season to season. And you need good analytics in order to target the resources and make the most difference. What we do is uh, run surveys every uh three to five years baseline surveys to understand um, the essential determinants of, of, of hunger uh, in a specific country. 
But we also do uh, high frequency surveys using uh, tools like mobile surveys, including uh, text messaging, interactive voice response, live calls. Uh, in conflict affected settings to understand how the most vulnerable people are experiencing hunger and, and, and what they, they need in priority. Uh, so to give you an example, in, in, in the case of Syria, we call up uh, approximately 1,500 Syrians every month to ask them about the foods that they eat. We ask them about what they do uh, when food supplies are short, what kind of coping strategies do they implement. We ask them to tell us their opinion of food security in their community. and. You know, and they'll come back to us with uh, statements that describe uh, the market or the, that describes production or that describes their access to social safety nets. We also monitor food markets quite, uh, quite closely. So uh, we've got a variety of tools that we deploy in order to better understand the problem. Why? You know, you've just described phone calls. You said SMS. Uh, I'm not sure if there, there was another uh, particular initiative or piece of the initiative there, a technology outreach. How is this different than what the World Food Program did in the past? Well, in, in the past, we'd uh, have our, our enumerators go out with clipboards. They would get on, get onto the big white U-line cars and and uh, travel the country for four to six weeks and, and come back with uh, data to the capital that would be put into a database. And we'd have, uh, I'd, I'd say, a, a good report with uh, very good data telling you what the situation is like. But that approach, you can't deploy everywhere. In, in, in the settings that are the most urgent emergencies right now, it's just too dangerous to send people out. Think of the cases of Yemen. Think of Iraq. South Sudan, mentioned Syria just a, a minute ago, uh, it's, it's just too dangerous to send people out. And we would call those places uh, gray areas. We would say, we don't really know what's going on. And in fact, uh, in those types of settings, if you were uh, on the wrong side of a front line uh, or in a community that's just too remote, uh, you'd be in a sense out of sight, out of mind. And uh, we believe that people were really suffering in silence. Now, what technology allows us to do is to reach out to people who were essentially suffering in silence and get information and hear their voices and, and share that with the broader community. The, the data we collect isn't only used at WFP. It's uh, shared with other UN agencies, with NGOs, with governments, with donors, so that we can all use it uh, to, to, to make the best possible decisions. So I'm, I'm interested in sort of the, the, even the, the deeper details. So you're calling 1,500 people a month. To talk to them, let's just let's just keep on the example of Syria. How do you get those phone numbers? Like, do you have a gigantic database, everyone, and then you sort of randomly pick a cluster or or a sample of some type? Uh, um, are they self-reporting and saying, "I'm I'm interested in you know taking part in this"? Is it you know aggregating through? I know you know you you cooperate with the Humanitarian Data Exchange, who will be on the show is who's been on the show here as well. If if they're too difficult for you to go in and, and talk to them face to face, how do you how do you find them? We have to be creative. So um, there, there are actually two strands to what we do in Syria. One of them is that it, it's speaking to, to people uh, in, in the most uh, complicated areas uh, of Syria and to obtain information about uh, food prices and, uh, and production. And that kind of data, you don't really need a gigantic sample to um, understand what's going on. If you're going for a representative household data, that's where you, you, you need to cast your net wider and uh, call people randomly. Uh, and um, we, we found that people were absolutely willing to, to, to talk to us. And what we actually do in a series is a, a rolling panel. Uh, so for those of you who do stats, what that means is that every month we, we do call 1,500 people, but a, about a third of the sample is retired um, every, every month in order to keep uh, uh, a healthy uh, sample. So basically so you're, not, you're, not the same, you're not calling the same people every month, basically. That's what you're trying we're, to do. We actually call... We retire a third of the sample every month, so that allows us to maintain the ability to, to compare month to month, uh, but also not to have uh, effects of uh, respondent fatigue or, or uh, we're essentially trying to control attrition by, by doing that. Is there additional incentive for these people to participate other than goodwill? I mean, and do you offer them some kind of incentive, either a monetary incentive? We, we usually do. We usually provide a, an airtime credit incentive that varies from country to country, and that's important to keep people engaged in the process. And in fact, uh, we, we, this, is, this is quite interesting. When we started doing this, um, it, it's in the literature. It says you, you, providing an incentive is a, a way to, to get good participation and good re response rates. Uh, but we were surprised to see that it's um, probably one of the more positive aspects of the project. It's, it, it enables people to go out and, and, and call their, their relatives and, and, and call their, um, the places that they might have fled during a conflict and obtain information that they can use to make themselves more food secure. Uh, the example of that was when we started um, uh, the project in eastern DRC in Congo. 
uh, we were calling people in, in, in a camp and they would get 50 cents airtime credit after each completed questionnaire. And people were thrilled uh, to get that 50 cent airtime um, credit incentive. Uh, they would be calling their villages and, and calling their relatives to know whether it was safe to go back. And we know that that's a huge decision uh, for, for, for people mm-hmm. who've been displaced, whether they go back or not. Or data from that, um, from that deployment showed that uh, when people leave the camp, uh, their food security outcomes improve dramatically. Now, people don't leave the camp because they're afraid of security and they have a lot of concerns about going back and, and making sure that uh, they're not going to have to face the same problems that, that brought them to the camp in the first place. But by obtaining better information through technology and thanks to the incentive that we provide, uh, we found that that's uh, actually quite empowering. Uh, and it, these, these are things we weren't able to do just a few years ago. What's your process for verification of either the individual or the, or the data? I mean, the first question I think a lot of people might ask is, you know, these people could just sort of be telling you what you want to hear or telling you information that's just false, making it up so that they can get that incentive? Is it, what's, what's the verification process? Is it just statistically looking at a lot of people telling you the same kind of thing, that it's relative data, or you tell me? The first thing we do is when we can, we do a baseline survey. So in that uh, camp in eastern Congo, we actually went out to the camp first before calling people up. Uh, and we, we actually have more than uh, probably close to 20 rounds of data uh, from, from Eastern Congo. But since we visited them first and explained the project and, and were able to collect detailed sociodemographic information uh, from the respondents, we, we can kind of tell if, if things look off. And we're able to, or, or, or data scientists are able to tell if, uh, if the data looks off, essentially. We also have the ability to look at the other sources of information. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that we look at food prices, we look at uh, the way a, a conflict scenario might be playing out. and if, the data is looking, um, again, off in some way. We're, we're, we're able to uh, go back and say, look, we have to, maybe we got something wrong. We'll go back and review that. We also rely on, on our operators. Uh, our operators are usually from the community, and they can tell if someone's telling them that something that's not true. So we've invested a lot in operator training. And in the case of Eastern Congo, our operators know that, uh, uh, for example, this month, you'd have a lot of beans uh, in Congo. And when we ask people, what have you been eating, if they don't mention beans, that's a little, uh, that requires some follow-up. Uh, mm-hmm. And the operator will say, look, beans are everywhere. Why, why, why didn't you mention it? We've invested in the human processes to, to make sure that we have uh, uh, good, uh, good data. And the other thing is also trust. It's been a, an important process for, um, it's an important ingredient in what we do. The um, relationship with the people who, who take the phone calls, it's not one-off. We usually call people a few times uh, and they, they actually know we're operators and they, they know us and we believe that we get much better information that way. And um, establishing a relationship of trust with uh, the people we're, we're in touch with has been a, a, big, uh, a big factor. Are, are the operators making the calls or do the, do the 150 analysts that you said earlier, are you guys making the calls? So we, we work with call centers all over the world. We've got one in Joburg, one in Haiti, uh, one in, um, I mean, we've, we've, got, we've got call centers all over the world that, uh, that collaborate with us. Uh, and they're the ones uh, placing the calls. The, the, the volume of calls is gigantic, Steve. It's, uh, I think this year we're on track to do a quarter of a million calls. Holy uh, cow. This is spread mm-hmm. uh, to 30 countries. So we're, we're just a few years ago, uh, we, we started the, our, our first calls in 2014. Uh, we were doing about 1,000 uh, a month if we were lucky. And now now we're, we're at very, very large numbers. So th- this illustrates that technology is really allowing you to scale these things up. Uh, it's it's much cheaper than doing the uh, the face-to-face interviews that I described. They're a good complement, uh, especially in, in conflict settings. So there, there's been real demand for, for, for this type of service. Uh, so what we do is work with private companies. Uh, so I, I mentioned the call centers. We also have companies that do um, uh, text message surveys or interactive voice response. Uh, that's uh, robocalls. You know, when you call up your bank and you have to navigate a, a set of voice prompts mm-hmm, to get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, we've, we've also done surveys uh, using interactive voice response. What's changed in the, um, I, I'd say in the in the space is that um, you've got vendors for, for these services now. Uh, they're also free and open source solutions that allow you to set up your own SMS survey system in-house uh, if you'd want. And that's really enabled the, the World Food Program but also other agencies to, to, to use these tools much more frequently. Uh, it used to be that you'd need uh, coding skills to do an interactive voice response surveys. Now they're... they're Just drag and drop now? Yes, drag and drop and, and much, much simpler to use than it was uh, a few, just a few years ago. Tell me about some Freakonomics, right? I mean, you're, you're doing a quarter of a million calls this, you know, this year, or you're on track to. 
it's focused on food security. What else are you learning? Is it, you know, like what's what's one or two of the fascinating things that you didn't expect to learn that, you know, maybe there's a trend that you see or, or, or have seen that, or your team has seen about these populations, or about movement, about about decision making, about reasons behind things. Are are there some fascinating things that that you've discovered? We get a lot of insights, especially from uh, what people tell us that's not part of the standard questionnaire. So, of course, we, we have our standard questions, and then we ask people, what do you have to say? And what people tell us is always very, very interesting. So an example I'll tell you is we deployed a mobile vulnerability analysis and mapping uh, using SMS surveys during the Ebola crisis. And during the Ebola crisis in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, uh, the fear was that uh, food prices had doubled and that, I mean, you have, you have articles in the, in the press that came out saying that uh, food prices were skyrocketing and that... Uh, sure, scarcity um, and people wouldn't come out of their homes right. and, yeah. Right. I mean, it, it was a big problem, but what people were actually telling us was slightly different, and it had a, a lot of implications on, on the way we responded. And the um, what people were telling us is that uh, they actually had food. Uh, they weren't able to, to sell it. What, what happened is that during the uh, epidemic, governments uh, set up quarantines to prevent uh, the epidemic from spreading geographically, but that also cut off trade routes. So you'd have areas with surpluses next to areas with deficits and prices increasing here, but really low, uh, not too far down the road. That actually uh, led us uh, as WFP to uh, uh, consider providing cash transfers instead of bringing food to to some of the communities. That was one insight we were able to get uh, from the surveys. So you started, you know, you said 2013 you were doing 1,000 phone calls a month, and now you are, you know, you're looking at a quarter of a million this year. What do you see changing in the next two, three, four years for this type of work? Is it, I was actually just at a a technology conference uh, a couple days ago where, you know, they're talking about mobile phone adoption. It's, you know, the LeapFrog event is happening in, in lots of places around the world, especially Africa, where people are going right to smartphones. You know, there's no feature phones. There's no SMS. Are you seeing, you know, developing an app? Or are you seeing where people can sort of self-report on a regular basis? What, what are the things that are on the horizon that, that are going to help this work? Sure. So, um, indeed, the, 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 the switch to smartphones is a big one for us. So, I told you all about SMS and robocalls, but we're, we're going to be moving to, to smartphone-based tools very soon. Uh, We have a chatbot. We have a prototype that's ready. The chatbot, her name is Callie, and Callie asks you about food security in your community. So if you have, if you use Telegram, you can um, add the uh, Callie to your friends, go through the the motions with her. And so that's, that's something we've tested here in Rome with um, a group of um, migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, uh, Rome is is actually on the way to Northern Europe for the the migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa crossing the Mediterranean. And uh, we were lucky to be able to to work with them. with, with some of these migrants to, to, to test or chatbot. So that's something we're working on right now that'll be deployed soon. The, and, and as you said, I mean, having a chatbot allows people to report in rather than us uh, calling them. And we, we, we think that's quite a progress. They would also be allowed, able to uh, send us pictures and, and their location. We, we, we think we've got a lot to learn there. The other thing we're doing right now, we're, we're, we launched our first site on Facebook's free basic service in Malawi. Uh, that happened uh, about a week ago. And uh, just to give you some context, Malawi is a country that was affected by El Nino. Uh, it's a big, a big drought happened last year uh, in all of Southern Africa. And uh, throughout Southern Africa, about 23 million people are affected by the drought and, and need, uh, uh, need food assistance. Uh, a lot of them are in Malawi. And the markets in Malawi have, been, have gone haywire uh, after this drought. And what we've done is set up a, a mobile-based monitoring system where we interview about 140 traders each week. And they, they, they tell us what the, the price of maize and beans are throughout the country. What we're doing with our, free, with, with our site on Free Basics is we're putting that information onto a site that works on any internet-enabled smartphone in Malawi, provided you have a SIM card of the two main operators put together. That's nearly 6 million subscriptions. And we make that information available for free. So the cost of accessing the website is, is, is free for uh, anyone in Malawi. And we believe that by providing this information that's updated every week, we can help people make better decisions about their own food security. Uh, and uh, we think there's uh, a lot of potential in terms of reach because of the number of people who have access to the website and the relevance of the, the information we provide. So we're, we're doing that. We're going to evaluate it. And uh, we look forward to scaling it because uh, Free Basics is actually available in, in over 50 countries right now. Mm. I only personally learned of Free Basics just a few days ago. I'm, I'm either embarrassed or excited to say I'm not sure. But that you know, Free Basics is a pretty powerful tool for some of these places. Right, it's it's powerful. We need to understand it better. So there'll be a lot of testing and piloting. What's for sure, the um, using SMS. Uh, I mean, it helped a lot over the past few years. But we know that that's uh, 
that's been dying out and, and it's, it's being replaced with uh, chat-based tools. And that's going to happen in, in places like Africa and, and, and Asia as well. And, um, but we also need to keep the, the, the ability to, to, to reach people through, through voice calls. Those call centers I told you about still have a very bright future because the populations we work with uh, sometimes have not been fortunate enough to go to school. Yeah, sure. Uh, so literacy is a barrier, and uh, so we will be working on on these new tools. But we're also strengthening what we're doing with the operator-based voice calls because it's it's a it's just a great way to contact people. When you think about you know instead of client-facing with with the people that you're trying to serve, but then donor-facing, right? Either with partners or with donor governments, is there importance in sort of remaining savvy, remaining cutting edge with the chatbots, with the free basics, with you know sort of you know looking towards that future? Do you find that that it's important to be savvy for for that part of the conversation? I think our donors are, are expect us to, to be looking at new things. And uh, those that we've worked with in the past, they actually understand when things don't work out. And that's really important for a donor. So we were fortunate to, to work with the Humanitarian Innovation Fund. We got a project started with the Humanitarian Innovation Fund. And uh, when things didn't work out, they actually told us, learn from it. And, uh, and we did. Hmm. For example, we tell us we what, had, tell um, yeah give us give an example of what you, you know what was the fail and what did you learn? For instance, we were working with uh, interactive voice response in Somalia and uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and what we figured out is that um, surveys through interactive voice response are, is not necessarily what we want to do because it, it's it's quite uh, complex for someone taking an IVR call for the first time, and we were just not getting good data. However, what was interesting is that the folks out in the field figured out how to use interactive voice response in their own context, and they've been using it for other things. They've been using it uh, to push out messages or to uh, allow people to call in uh, and uh, tell the office about an issue. Uh, so it's been using for, it's been, IVR has been used more for feedback and um, interaction rather than surveys. Surveys are a little bit too complex for IVR in the settings where, where, we, where we experimented with it. So that was an interesting learning for us. You come across... As I mean, thankfully, obviously, and, and this is a compliment, I mean, as extraordinarily savvy in both the technology but also just the food security conversation, which came first for you? Or, or, were, you were you a geek, you know, a tech geek to start with and, and you, you wanted to contribute to food security or did it happen the opposite direction? And how have you personally sort of seen your career continue to, how are you continuing to navigate that? All right, so in, in my case, I started with uh, WFP in 2001 in West Africa and stayed in West Africa for about 10 years before uh, moving to Rome, where I've, I've worked on, on these projects. I'd say I've always had an interest in technology, just just um, just from my, my, my own personal background. I, I mean, I'm not a I'm not a geek. I, I, I don't I don't have a degree in, in uh, computer science or anything. But uh, we I've love geeks. Don't worry. I meant, I meant that I meant that in the in the kindest, most gentlest. Oh way. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not, not hating on geeks here at all. But I mean, I, I think. When I look back to what I was doing, uh, say 10 years ago, I, I was interested in automating things and in and, um, uh, and databases and uh, getting those to, to work right. And um, I was actually so I, I was at the college in the U.S. And uh, uh, of course, when you show up in Africa, the the use of technology is just very different. And I realized that was something I brought uh, to my organization was the um, uh, the interest uh, for technology and the belief that it could change things for, for the better. And uh, I guess that um, showing up in Rome uh, in a position where I was able to have influence and drive change uh, meant that um, those ideas ended up helping in the way they, they did. So your initiative is called the Vulnerability Analysis and Mapping Initiative. And so you know, mapping's in your name. You know, what do you use the maps for? I mean, obviously, they look pretty. They look good. Everybody loves a map. What do you use those layers for? Have, and and the sort of secondarily, have other people taken those layers and put them on top of theirs and, and discovered interesting things or discovered things that allowed them to change their programming or, or make better decisions? The idea here really is to help people who are in the most insecure and, and vulnerable settings and, and make sure that the right assistance reaches them. So uh, when we do maps, we map out food consumption, we map out uh, agroclimatic issues, we map out what people are telling us, uh, and, and that's brought to our managers. And the, the idea is to uh, help our managers make better decisions about where the resources are allocated. Our objective here uh, is, is to uh, show where the most acute needs are, to ensure that the prioritization process takes place and that, uh, the, again, the scarce resources that we have in, 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 in the organization are directed to the people who have the most acute needs. An example, uh, Steve, is that um, this was in, in 2015. We, uh, we were doing surveys in Iraq. We realized that the price of a bag of wheat in the city of Haditha in Iraq 
cost eight hundred dollars. That's extreme. Price of a bag of weed in Baghdad. Eight hundred dollars. You're killing me. Are you yeah, serious? yeah, yeah. I'm serious, and I, and you, you know, in fact, when they told us eight hundred, we told them, well, look, you probably you mean eight dollars, not eight hundred. Uh, but uh, we 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 had to call the guy back and verified it, and yeah, it was it was eight hundred dollars. This is because the city was besieged um, at the time. You can understand that, that any place where a bag of weed costs eight hundred dollars, you've got a serious food security problem. Uh, so that information was was brought to um, our country director in Iraq, uh, who shared it with the rest of the UN uh, community. And, and as a group, the UN sent a convoy to Haditha uh, with enough food to feed 15,000 people for a month. My next question is this. What's the biggest hurdle for you in terms of innovating in the space or in terms of continuing to keep fresh technologically or keep fresh in you know being more effective? Like, is it funding, simply, you know, simply funding? Is it... Um, bringing people on board? Is it just the size of the problem? Is it competition? What are the things that kind of keep you up at night as far as hurdles? Well, first of all, and you mentioned this, is that the technology just keeps changing and uh, there's a huge cost for us to adopt something new. And by the time we've adopted something new, well, the technology has changed and we have to to stay nimble. And that's that's really one of the major challenges for us. The other challenge is uh, onboarding people. So the vulnerability analysis and mapping service at WFP has existed for some time and um, use these new tools. Yeah, I mean, there, there is, again, quite an effort that needs to take place to validate and uh, and share the knowledge and uh, and get people on board. Uh, it takes some time. Uh, and I, I, I think I've seen uh, probably people in, in, in other sectors be able to be more flexible with the adoption of new things. And uh, for us, uh, it takes a little bit longer. Those are two things that come to mind immediately. Would you say that vulnerability mapping and, and analysis, or sorry, analysis and mapping initiative, is this a standard op now in World FP, in WFP? It, it's just sort of taken for granted that this happens and this is the way that it's done, or are you still sort of waiting to be locked in as, as something that's standard? Well, it, it's it's been around for, for quite some time, and what we're doing is we're developing new tools that we're adding to the existing uh, toolkit. So, as I said, we would do large-scale face-to-face surveys, uh, we would do agro meteorology. Uh, we would do market analysis. Uh, this this has been the mainstay of what we've done in in VAM for I'd say more than more than ten years now. The new things uh, using mobile, using uh, chatbot and free basics, and looking at big data analysis. We've got some some good examples there. That's getting mainstream, but not quite there yet. I I think the mobile surveys, uh, as I've told you, that's been those are being used in about thirty countries. So we can say that those have been mainstream. Big data analysis and the use of, uh, for example, uh, call detail record data or transactions analysis, that's more cutting edge, and it'll, it'll take some time for us to, to deploy that uh, worldwide. So, yeah, I guess that you, you kind of answered my question there, but just, just to follow up and, and feedback. So when, let's just say, you know, the next food crisis, you know, is going to happen here in, in Southeast Asia, and, and you guys sort of have your indicators, and would the first thing would be that people would say, hey, look, we need to deploy VAM and and get it going and start the call survey, you know, the surveys going on, on the phone? Or is that something that you still need to advocate for and, and make sure that it happens? I think we're it, it would happen quite quickly. And uh, we're actually uh, scaling up in Asia right now. We're uh, working. Uh, we, we've done our first reports in Afghanistan uh, this month, planning on, on working in uh, Myanmar, Laos, Papua New Guinea, uh, Nepal. So what's going to happen now is that uh, it used to be that there was a disaster and that we would look at an, an old assessment and say, here's our best guess of uh, who might have been affected in priority. Uh, but right now we're able to do things like look at the phone survey data. We're able also to consider big data sources on mobility. Uh, for example, after the earthquake in Nepal in 2015, one of our partners, uh, Flowminder, uh, was able to look at uh, NCEL data. This is the, the, the main phone company in Nepal. And they were able to estimate displacement at the district level and provide estimates of how many people had moved from Kathmandu uh, Valley out. And uh, that was vital information for us because right when you know where the people are, you know what places were most affected and also where, where people with need might, might actually be. So this, this signal information, so it's not, no longer a survey, but actually capturing signals from either cell phone networks or banking networks, uh, that would allow us to, to be more responsive and to understand where people have moved to and, and whether they're in duress. That's what you'll see in the future. Mm. So you, you mentioned uh, earlier that this got started or, or part of it got kicked off through the Humanitarian Innovation Fund. How else is this funded? I mean, what keeps you going other than your core funding from World Food Program? Is it Do you have partners that are contributing? Do you have specific donor funds? Or are you just shaving off a part of program funding from, as you said, the 30 countries you're implementing right now? Or, or how does that work? So our funding um, comes from uh, different sources. I mentioned the Humanitarian Innovation Fund, which is a pool fund. 
the at the time uh, we obtained funding from them, they were financed by uh, Canada and uh, DFID. I think they might have other donors on board right now. Internally at WFU, we also have uh, the Innovation Accelerator. So when we have a bright idea, uh, we will talk to our colleagues at the Innovation Accelerator, uh, and they might be able to provide some support. And then we might also go out bilaterally to, um, to, to some of our donors with who might be interested in a specific um, uh, project. So those are the three ways we, we can obtain support for, for, for new ideas. The last two questions I have for you are two that I, I'm asking everybody here as we, we're pursuing this innovation mm-hmm. series. And, and the first one is, you've been doing this for a while, but how do you stay fresh? You know, you've talked about chatbots, you've talked about free basics. I mean, you're clearly cutting edge. Are there blogs you pay attention to? Are there networks you, you make sure you pay attention to, magazines you read? Like, what are your go-to sources for information to keep fresh on this stuff? Right. So you, you need to be in that work and you need to keep eyes and ears wide open to what's going on around you. Honestly, I, I don't read that much of the tech press in the U.S. because there's too much going on. I wouldn't be I, I can't handle it. There's just too much. Uh, so uh, so I love that's the cool filters. information. Overwhelm, uh, one of them is, uh, <laughs> yeah. One of them is, is Patrick Meyer, who's um, someone who's worked on technology and, and their use. I recommend you check out. But it's he's looked at a lot of different uh, initiatives, including uh, use of social media information, UAVs. Unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, also known as, as drones. Uh, he is looking at uh, robotics in the humanitarian space. Uh, so people like that are, are actually quite good at capturing the trends that we in the humanitarian world might want to look at, and also connecting us with uh, with the right folks. We, we're also fortunate to have an office in um, in the U.S. that is actually better than we are from here in Rome, but better than we are at uh, identifying uh, cutting edge trends and, and putting us in touch with the right people. So the last question I have for you is, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to geek out. It's an opportunity to sort of just have some fun. Is there an innovation in the humanitarian space that you think is super cool that's, that's not related to food security, not related to your day-to-day that you'd like to either get a shout-out to or you just, you just like you're, you're following it, you think it's awesome? Look, uh, I've been very interested in, in seeing um, the discussions around the use of blockchain in the humanitarian space. Blockchain uh, is, is it's called a distributed ledger. What it actually does is, is help you track financial transactions in a way that hasn't been possible before. Uh, and uh, it, it speaks to accountability uh, and transparency of, of, of assistance. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see how that's going to develop in the humanitarian space. And possibly w- even within the food security space, there's a uh, potential for that to help people with uh, contracting for food commodities, for instance, which is it's been a huge issue in Africa, how, how these um, uh, contracts are made and how commodity markets work. So that's something uh, I'm, I'm monitoring and hoping to understand better. Uh, but uh, for sure, there's already been pilots out there that show a lot of potential. J.M., this has been a fascinating conversation. You are you know, not only clearly know what you're talking about, but just exciting things in the future. And hopefully that will uh, turn into better food security for everyone. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Steve. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Yeah.